This rare and early digital clock is the Broadcast Products Inc. model BPC-101C and it dates to around 1970 so it was one of the first digital clocks on the market although as the company name suggests this clock was not intended for the average consumer it was meant for use in broadcast automation on the back here is the power switch the fuse which I had to replace with a uh, more appropriate one I used a quarter amp fuse and the connector for the start, stop, and reset controls on the front. We'll switch it on for you guys now. As you saw, it came up all zeros and uh, started counting right away. That can be stopped by pressing the stop button or restarted with the start button and cleared with the reset button. This is actually a dual purpose device. It can be used as both a timer and a 12-hour digital clock. I've never seen another one of these for sale. Unlike some other early digital clocks, the controls on this one are quite precise and don't have the usual jumpiness that you see. They did a good job on debouncing the inputs. As you can see, each press of the button is only incrementing the respective digit by one. Once you've got the exact time punched in, you can just wait until a more accurate time source indicates that same time and then press the start button and it'll proceed on from there. You can also increment the displays while the clock is running and it'll roll over from 12.59 to 1 o'clock. The Nixie tubes in this clock are fairly tired. I believe they are original to it or at least all but one of them are. This one here is a replacement. They are long life tubes though, so I think they still have a decent number of hours left. But they are fairly silvered. I am keeping my eyes open for replacements. I'll take the cover off to show you guys the insides. I'll unplug it as well. To take it apart you just remove these three screws on the side here and then the three screws on the other side. That is the mirror of this one. On the bottom there's a little folding kickstand and four stout rubber feet. Once you've got those screws out the cover just lifts off. Revealing the circuitry inside. I would say the circuitry of the logic board is fairly clever. As the number of TTL gates in here actually isn't that high, considering this clock has uh, two functions. This clock was running when I received it, but it was honestly quite astonishing that it still worked, considering the amount of damage to the power supply section. You can see that I've replaced a number of components myself, namely all of the capacitors and some of the resistors. You'll notice there's a hole there. The resistor that used to occupy that space had completely burned up and carbonized the board underneath it to the point that it was conductive. Now even though the resistor had gone open circuit, the board was burned so bad that it was acting like a resistor itself at a fairly low resistance. So I had to cut away the carbonized section there. Whoever repaired this before me troubleshooted a lot of the circuit by clipping one leg of components and then soldering them back in place. Whoever repaired this clock before me, probably the previous owner, also added this resistor here, but I found that to be a reasonable modification so I left it in place. That resistor drops the voltage to these tubes down to around 175 volts, which is appropriate for this type of Nixie tube. This resistor is in series with the high voltage line, but the original setup of this clock was to have a resistor across the high voltage line to load it down. That resistor is what burned up. I replaced it with these two resistors here in series whose only purpose is to discharge the high voltage filter capacitor when the clock is off to reduce the shock hazard from this clock. This is the high voltage filter capacitor here and this is the main filter capacitor and these uh, components here are in the voltage regulator circuit 
for the 5 volt supply. There's also significant carbonization underneath this transistor here, which is the series pass transistor used to you know, regulate that 5 volt supply. Because the voltage across it is low, I didn't feel I needed to try and clear away the carbonization there, so I left that alone. Honestly, this transistor here should have been mounted on the back of the cabinet so it can uh, be used as a heatsink. I don't think that was a good design, putting uh, such a hot running part here. One nice feature of this clock is that the logic board is socketed, so you can just undo these screws here and then pull the board out or remove the front, but that's more annoying because there's all these switches there. And the switches are actually connected through the edge connector, so you can leave them behind. You'll notice most of the parts are dated 1970, although some are dated earlier than that. As you can see, there's uh, some from 1969 or even 1968, like this uh, SN7492. Linux tubes themselves are CK8754 tubes from uh, towards the end of 1970. Assuming that 70-49 is a uh, date code there. This one here has a different date code. All the chips in here are made by Texas Instruments with the exception of this one that's made by Motorola. This one is clearly a replacement and uh, some of the other solder connections in this area have been redone so there must have been some problem with this digit and the uh, previous owner tried to troubleshoot that. The connector on the back of the clock is for the start, stop, and reset controls in case you want to remotely control it. I'll plug it in quick and switch it on just so you guys can see it run without the uh, filter in the way. Nice side view of those pretty Nixie tubes. Well, thanks for watching.